All right, so um, hey everyone, um, thanks again for uh, joining and welcome to the webinar on unpacking Kony app platform V8 service pack 2. My name is Tanway and I'm the community manager at Kony and today's webinar is going to highlight the new set of features and enhancements on Kony Visualizer and Kony Fabric. Your host and experts for today's session is Faizan and Suhas. Um, before we start the session, let me tell you that uh, we have Q&A panel available for you guys to post your questions. Um, do not use the chat box, um, use the Q&A panel. We have a dedicated team who is monitoring the Q&A panel and they will answer your questions. Um, we are also recording this webinar and uh, we'll post it in the article section on Basecamp uh, so that you can you know, refer to it again later. Uh, we also have a couple of polls we'll be running during the event, so make sure you participate in these polls. So let's start the presentation um, and over to you, Fezan. Thanks, Tanmay. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to all the attendees joining us today from across the world. Uh, I'll quickly start sharing my presentation and let's, let's get started. Okay, so I'll start with a quick review of our mission at Kony, and it's important to know what we do at Kony every day. Uh, so at Kony, we enable and accelerate our clients' omni-channel digital journeys with exceptional, secure, and affordable apps. Right, so that's 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 our agenda, and that's that's what our mission uh, every day at Kony. Uh, so with that, we have a packed agenda today, and we'll start with a quick overview of the app platform. Uh, then we'll do a recap of the uh, of some of the earlier releases before uh, that came in before the V8 service pack two. And with that, we will uh, look at a few highlights of our uh, app platform V8 service pack two release and see what are the new and look at some of the new features that are packed into the uh, the app platform release. Uh, some, of, uh, some of you may have attended our earlier webinar on the app platform roadmap, and with this release, uh, you will observe that we have added many of the new features that we had talked about and we had reviewed during that, uh, during that webinar. Uh, for our viewers who are new to the Kony app platform, uh, let me start with a quick overview. So Kony app platform uh, basically uh, is a platform that allows you to develop mobile applications, uh, and these are like rich mobile applications which allow, and uh, where, you, uh, where we have like these two products, Kony Visualizer and Kony, uh, Kony Fabric. Kony Visualizer is the front end that allows you to you know, design and develop uh, applications it has a lot of low-code capabilities as part of its uh, design capabilities, and, and it allows the users to create, you know, very powerful and uh, extremely, uh, you know, complex applications as well using our advanced developer capabilities. Uh, Kony Visualizer encapsulates uh, all the native APIs that are available as part of, you know, as part of the uh, underlying operating systems like the iOS or OS uh, or the Android operating system and and even uh, the uh, the web and the hybrid channels, right? So, so Kony Visualizer is the product that allows you to, you know, build and design and build applications for your phones, tablets, desktops, wearable devices, chaos, and even chatbots. Uh, now, to complement Kony Visualizer, which is a front end of the, uh, of the platform, we have Kony Fabric. So Kony Fabric is, is the back end, right? And it's, it's an extremely powerful back end that packs a bunch of uh, client-side SDKs that, that help you integrate with, uh, with object services, with integration services, and a, and, a, and a good amount of, you know, data connectors and data adapters. Uh, with which you can connect to your enterprise uh, enterprise systems. Uh, Kony Fabric also has the capabilities like API management uh, and a lot of analytics and reporting and, and those kinds of capabilities as well. Now I'll not get into the details in all of these, but there is uh, there's a lot of details available on the app platform uh, on Basecamp, and uh, I would encourage all of you to go in and you know read through. Uh, more details into each of these uh, capabilities of the app platform. 
Now, to complicate, uh, to complement the app platform, we have the, we have this uh, underlying enterprise systems and services, like being able to send, you know, the uh, notifications through campaigns, or being able to uh, have content management, being able to, you know, personalize data and things like that. And uh, along with that, we have the Kony Marketplace, which helps you, uh, you reuse a lot of, you know, your development artifacts when you are building applications with Kony. Right, uh, with the Kony app platform. So you can reuse applications, you can reuse collections within applications, you can create components that can be reused across. And these are not just, you know, for the front end uh, part of the application, but it spans across, uh, you know, the front end and the back end app, uh, part of your project. So with that, let's move on and uh, let's quickly. Uh, do a recap of the last three releases, right? So, so this is this recap is going all the way to our Kony uh, to our uh, 7.3 release, right? So, until 7.3 release, we used to refer uh, to our platform with two different uh, as two different products, the Kony Visualizer and the Kony Fabric, right? And this this release was uh, almost uh, more than a year back now, which is April 2, 2017, and we. Added a bunch of uh, a bunch of very uh, you know powerful capabilities like the ability to create uh, create your projects in Visualizer using a reference architecture, uh, being able to uh, use the App Viewer application or the App Preview application along with Visualizer through a USB, being able to support app extensions. And then being able to, you know, and then having a bunch of, you know, uh, uh, extremely nice features like being uh, like the geo body notifications and uh, being able to debug applications through the Chrome debugger and things like that. And on the fabric, we had uh, many new features as well, like a, a, a new set of connectors and a, a data adapter SDK to, to help with, you know, the connector connection to fabric. Uh, and then we had a bunch of updates on the uh, analytics dashboard that we have, and then uh, enhancements to the scheduled jobs and API help checks. The V8 release of the app platform was a major release, and this was uh, on the uh, you know on the on the latter quarter of 2017. Uh, we added a, it was a major release where on Visualizer we added this entire component architecture and the component framework. Now this enhanced the amount of visibility that you could get with your applications on Visualizer, and being able to create these components, being able to use these components across Visualizer, and these components, like I said, could you know span across uh, Visualizer and your Fabric uh, applications. And all these, uh, to, to, you know, to host all these components, we created the Kony Marketplace. And uh, today on the Marketplace, we have more than 200 components that can be used by, you know, Kony developers uh, anywhere, and they can, they can use it to, you know, improve their productivity of, you know, creating their applications. And uh, it, it, uh, it enhances and improves the speed of which you can create your applications. Along with that, we added a bunch of uh, bunch of other features as well. Because, like I said, it was a major release. We added uh, a lot of UX patterns within Visualizer. We added uh, the capability to port flex properties. Uh, we added the capability to add app groups to generate universal binaries for iOS and Android. And then we added uh, several of the features on the CI and the uh, marketplace itself. On, the, on Fabric, we added capabilities like uh, being able to, you know, uh, do API management within Fabric, uh, being able to visually uh, map data elements for object services, right? So we, we added a new visual data mapper within Fabric that allows you to, you know, do the mapping. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, we keep enhancing the number of connectors we have in Fabric. So this release, again, was a major release with, you know, m multiple enhancements and additions to the connectors and uh, for not only, uh, you know, uh, for identity, but for integration and object. A bunch of enhancements that we did for offline objects as well. And, uh, you know, uh, a few enhancements across notifications and things like that. So V8 was our major release, and then we had a smaller release with our V8 SP uh, Service Pack 1. This came at the end of uh, end of last year, and uh, this packed in a few features as well. Again, uh, a, a few features which are you know uh, which 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 could be more region specific, like being able to support 
uh, locale based, based layouts to support, you know, languages that, you know, start from the right and move towards the left. Uh, being able to support the new OSs, uh, which which came out during that time of the year, like being able to support the uh, new iOS, uh, being able to support the new Android OS, uh, which is Android Oreo, being able to support the new phones as well, like uh, we we added support for iPhone 10, Face ID support, and all those kinds of things with this with that particular release. On Fabric, we added a bunch of features on offline objects, being able to, uh, you know, support SQL uh, encryption, uh, being able to batch, uh, you know, the, the upload the uh, artifacts and being able to upload larger binaries and things like that, and then a few other features like the CI and parallel builds. Now, with that, uh, SP1 was the last release before the Service Pack 2. The Visualizer V8 Service Pack 2 released in mid-May. And that's what uh, you know. We will uh, we will look at, uh, and we will you know we'll walk through, and we'll talk about during this webinar. So with every release, we work with a set of themes, right? So a set of themes that guide us to the features that we are implementing as as part of this particular uh, as, as part of a particular release. So the themes that we had as part of the service pack two was uh, were modern web design and deployment. Uh, rich digital experiences, accelerated developer productivity, and enhancements to the Kony Cloud, right? So across these teams, we have made several enhancements. So uh, on, on the modern web and design and deployment capabilities, we have added, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a huge set of, you know, responsive web design tooling within Kony Visualizer, right? So, so one of the major features of this release on Kony Visualizer is to be able to design fully responsive web applications uh, within uh, using all the capabilities that already exist for Visualizer, like the canvas that we have and things like that. We'll get into each of these uh, features uh, in the next few slides, and we'll talk about you know what, all the details of, of, of each of these features. But just as a summary, we have added uh, multiple, uh, you know, performance enhancements to our uh, existing web uh, deployments, to our existing web publish, to the and entire web. Uh, a lot of a lot and lot of investments that we have made around, you know, our web design and development uh, within Visualizer. We keep improving our digital experiences, with which we mean that we try to, you know. Uh, help users design applications which are, you know, with a, which are cutting edge with extremely, uh, you know, rich uh, UX experiences and things like that. So for the, uh, keeping that in view, we have added uh, features such as being able to import a sketch design directly within Visualizer and to use it as part of the Visualizer project. Uh, being able to design applications for Android Wear. So we already support Apple uh, Apple Watches. Uh, prior to SP2, but now with SP2 release, the service pack to release, we we go ahead and you know we cover the Android Wear uh, support as well. We've added multiple extensions as part of our marketplace as well to support things like chatbots, to support voice recognition capabilities, collaboration, social media, and security capabilities as well. So you would see a lot of features around these. Uh, areas, and then you would see a lot of marketplace components that we have enhanced and uploaded onto the marketplace. Uh, with every release, our major goal and major focus is to accelerate developer productivity, right? So we want to uh, we want to ensure that our developers are developing apps faster, so that they can develop more apps within within the same time, right? So we have added features on the reference architecture to enhance reference architecture, to enhance the generation capability on the reference architecture. We've added a bunch of CI CD capabilities and, a, and we have added, you know, uh, a, a lot of capabilities to our, our offline objects and made it like fully, gener uh, fully, fully GA with all the new features that we have in offline objects. And again, we'll talk about, you know, the details in that in, in the upcoming slides. Uh, we keep updating our uh, our Kony only channel APIs and widgets with every release, and we have added a, you know a bunch of enhancements in, in this uh, in this release as well uh, to ensure you know you have these only channel cross platform APIs and widgets available to build your app. Uh, on the cloud, we have added a bunch of enhancements as well to be able to uh, uh, you know do container based deployments at runtime using Docker and Kubernetes. 
uh, being able to uh, do self so uh, being able to uh, have a self service upgrade, and then a bunch of you know compliance uh, enhancements that we did to uh, to you know meet the standards such as PCI DSS and GDPR. Uh, with that said, I'll move on to uh, to you know a deeper dive into some of these features in itself, right? So. So with this, let's get into uh, some of these features which will be covered by me and some of them will be covered by Suhas as, as in the latter part of this, uh, of this session. So as when I talked about the modern web design and dev uh, deployment, uh, a major portion of this was responsive web tooling. So we have added a canvas within Visualizer to design applications for responsive web. We've added the capabilities to define breakpoints within those canvas and being able to, you know, uh, view the reflection of the UX you create per breakpoint, and then uh, the ability to create uh, and fork, you know, the not only the UX uh, and not only the layout and skins for the breakpoints, be, but also to be able to, you know, fork the data across the breakpoints as well, right? Uh, we have also added the responsive layout ruler within the canvas as well to, you know, in, uh, to, to, you know, in, in, in enhance the uh, develop the design experience of uh, responsive web layouts within Visualizer as well. So the, what would you what you would see as part of uh, Service Pack 2 when you when you upgrade to Service Pack 2 is a new uh, output channel or a new channel that's supported by Visualizer called responsive. Right. As part of these responsive website, uh, as part of this responsive channel, you can create responsive web outputs, and uh, you know you can also go ahead and use uh, some of the framework level APIs that we have provided to you know manipulate these breakpoints at runtime. Now, one of the things uh, to note over here is the current desktop web users can also use this responsive web capabilities. So once you upgrade to Visualizer uh, Service Pack 2, you are still uh, using your desktop web capability that you already have, but then you have an option within settings to, you know, upgrade this or move this to the responsive web channel, right? So when you do that, you have the capability to add breakpoints to your uh, the web application and then, you know, create a responsive web output out of that. So with that said, let's uh, look at a quick demo of this, right? So the first thing that you will notice in Service Pack 2 is the new channel that shows uh, responsive web, right? So as part of the Project Explorer, uh, one thing that you would observe uh, is the responsive web channel. So <clears throat> the Project Explorer now has mobile, tablet, responsive web, or desktop, right? So this is a new channel that's been added. Now, on the properties panel for this responsive web channel, you would notice uh, options where you can go ahead and set breakpoints. So you have a few breakpoints that are set by default, and then you can go and add and delete uh, new breakpoints as needed. Now, on the canvas itself, uh, you would notice uh, the grid layout behind the design that I have on my canvas. Right, and at the top, uh, you, uh, on the ruler, you, you can see the three breakpoints, right? So each of those uh, red arrows at the top denotes a breakpoint. So now if I go and change my uh, breakpoint, what's gonna happen is that the design, uh, uh, my canvas is gonna move from, you know, uh, one breakpoint to the other. So in this example, I have a mobile breakpoint, I have a tablet breakpoint, and then I have a desktop breakpoint, right? Now, if you have noticed on each of these breakpoints, not only the layout, uh, not only the, the the UX of this uh, of my app changes, but even the layout can change, right? So some of these widgets that I have on one on one breakpoint may not be available for the other, right? So again, so this is the capability that we added within Visualizer, and then once you run this. Uh, on your web browser, within a mobile on the left, or within, you know, within uh, a full desktop on the right, you would see uh, uh, the the web application reacting to the width of the uh, of the of the layout that you have right now. So this was um, one of the major uh, features that we added with uh, with Service Pack 2. And uh, moving ahead, uh, we also made a bunch of performance enhancements and cloud hosting enhancements as part of our more um, our modern web uh, design and deployment capabilities with Service Pack 2. Uh, there has been tremendous performance enhancements, again, the, some of these owing to, you know, some of the 
some of the base level changes that we have done to the packages uh, that these applications, uh, uh, how these applications are built with. So we have a new zip package that we have introduced apart from the WAR file that we used to generate and deploy on Fabric. Uh, and then this has enhanced our app publish times to be 13x faster, right? So now most of your applications would, uh, would you know, publish to Fabric within under a minute. Right, so app publish times have improved about 10 to 15 times faster. Uh, the web application launch times have been optimized to be three to four times faster. And then we have made a few minor enhancements to the build time as well, but in, uh, you know, in the next upcoming releases, you would see uh, some major improvements as part of the build as, as well. So again, you have a bunch of enhancements, not only for, you know, the, the uh, deployment and, uh, you know, publishing of the web applications, but even on the framework itself. So we have added new capabilities and enhancements as part of, you know, widgets that you use within the web applications, like supporting list, list boxes within segments, so being able to, you know, uh, add lazy loading capabilities within uh, for a segment widget. Uh, enhanced look and feel for widgets like calendar and switch and the text boxes and things like that. Uh, a lot of these enhancements are listed as part of our release notes. Uh, please go in and, and have a look at that. You will have more details into each of these and you could, uh, and then you can drill down into, you know, each of these uh, features and each of these enhancements and have a, uh, have a better understanding of each of these features. Now, uh, uh, apart from, you know, all the enhancements that we made on, you know, the modern uh, web and digital uh, the, um, the modern web and design and uh, experience, we also made a bunch of enhancements as part of the rich digital experiences like we talked about. And one of the major ones as part of this was being able to uh, import the sketch UX uh, within, uh, within Pony Visualizer, right? So if you, have, if you have designers developing, you know, the mocks for your applications or designer developing, you know, the early stage uh, you know, uh, previews for your application, what you can, uh, and if they are using Sketch. So majority of our user, majority of the designer community uh, today across the world use uh, either Photoshop or they use Sketch for designing and, you know, uh, these, uh, these mock-ups or early stage prototypes for their mobile applications. So we already support Photoshop uh, imports within Visualizer with our earlier releases. And now with this particular release, we have added support for Sketch as well. So there is a new plugin that we have added, released uh, that is supported within Sketch. So you can add this plugin within Sketch, use it, uh, and use, use it to, you know, generate Kony Visualizer forms uh, through uh, the Sketch artboard. So if you're, if you're familiar with how Sketch works, Sketch has a bunch of artboards that, you know, you can design. So we, what you can do with this new plugin is, I mean, you have the ability to convert these artboards into visualizer forms. And then uh, Sketch also has this concept of symbols. So symbols are reusable uh, artifacts within Sketch. So we have also, uh, you know, added this feature where you can uh, convert Sketch symbols into Kony visualizer components, right? So you can convert them into Kony components, and then maybe at some point use this, these reusable components across your applications or upload them to the marketplace as well to help all the other uh, the other user, uh, user community across across the Kony's ecosystem. Uh, we also so the the Kony uh, the Sketch uh, plugin has the capabilities to support vector-based and resolution-independent designs. Uh, and, uh, you know, it supports uh, updates that are made incrementally uh, and re-imported into Visualizer, being able to support the freeform projects as well as being able to support the reference architecture project. But that here is a quick uh, demo of this feature, right? So this is Sketch here. And within Sketch, you have the option to, you know, select a few of the artboards, right? So on the left, you see all the artboards. On the right, you see the canvas with, you know, a, a, pro, a preview of the artboard. So here I selected these artboards, and then I'll go into the plugins menu at the top, and then select the Pony Visualizer plugin, right? So you have the option to uh, import this plugin. The plugin is available as part of the download, uh, as part of the Pony download. You can download this plugin, add it as part of the, uh, you know, as part of your sketch. Now, if you look at the panel that kind of came up over here, uh, this is the Pony Visualizer plugin, or this is the panel that comes up with the Pony Visualizer uh, extension in Sketch. 
And if you look at here, you have a lot of options, right? So you have an option to, you know, uh, set, set your layouts for mobile, tablet, or desktop. You have the options to either export as freeform JavaScript or export, uh, ex export the application as uh, a reference architecture application. So you can go ahead, set all these values in Sketch, and then click on the export or export button at the bottom of the screen, right? So you can, you know, you can uh, you can export or you can convert the shapes in Sketch as images. You can convert them as containers uh, or pony widgets, basically, and things like that. So, so here uh, it's showing the overall progress of converting, you know, uh, Sketch artboard into a pony visualizer form. And then once that is done. Uh, when we go into visualizer, we can import the right. So I can go in and import uh, this within visualizer and all the uh, artworks that I had within, uh, you know, within Sketch get imported into visualizer. Once I have that, I can go in and build my application uh, and view it on the app viewer application, right? So this just enhances or improves the overall build and design and development cycle. Uh, a lot, right? Because you are reusing a lot of the, you know, a lot of the early stage prototypes, a lot of the mockups that you know your designers are already working on, right? So this is one of the major features that we added as part of Visualizer. Uh, we have also, uh, like we talked about earlier, added the capability for you know uh, Android Wear tooling, and we have added a new channel that for Android Wear. So now you can visually design and develop apps for Android Wear within Pony Visualizer. So Visualizer has a canvas to design the square and round, uh, round watch faces. Uh, and then you can reuse the business logic that you've already been using for, you know, your mobile apps or your tablet apps. Uh, within your uh, Wear applications as well. There are a bunch of uh, APIs that we have added, you know, to communicate between your, you know, the mobile or the tablet application and the Wear application as well. Uh, again, here is a quick demo of how this looks like. So uh, here I have a, a, an application that we built with Android Wear. Uh, you see all the features that have been added and in this particular uh, project in Visualizer, what you see is the new uh, Android Wear, uh, the new Android Wear channel that's been added as part of the wearables. So we already had support for Apple Watch. We've added the Android Wear channel, and then you can go in there. You can design, uh, you know, your applications using Android Wear. You're using the same familiar widgets that you were using, like images, segments, and things like that. Uh, and then once you do that, uh, once you design, uh, you can also write business logic again using JavaScript for Android Wear. Uh, and then once you do that, you have a set of settings uh, that you can set for Android Wear as well. And then, you know, build your application either in as a round face or as a square face because Android Wear supports both kind of faces. And then once you uh, once you have all your settings done on Visualizer, you go ahead, select the new option for you know Android Wear as an output channel, and uh, build your applications. Once you do that, you see your applications, you know, uh, running on, you know, both the square watch faces and their own watch faces as well, right? So uh, with that, let's move ahead. Uh, uh, we have also added a, a bunch of features to accelerate the developer productivity. So we keep on adding new and new, uh, new uh, features and enhancements to Pony Visualizer with every release. Uh, in this particular release, as we have added features uh, like being uh, to, to you know generate a model layer with getters and setters as part of a reference architecture project. So if you are using reference architecture project, you can now go to the Pony Fabric uh, node, right click on it, generate a model layer, and this model layer would have getters and setters to each of the uh, for each of the fields in your object as part of your object service. So if your object ha object uh, services for for getting a list of contacts, uh, you have the contact list. Within this contact list, you might have a first name and a last name. So what we do is we generate a get who get first name to retrieve the first name and a set first name to you know set the first name. So those kinds of features, and then we have also added the capability to import and merge visualizer projects. So what you can do is you can export your visualizer project and uh, maybe as micro apps and then improve, uh, import these visualizer projects into, you know, a parent visualizer project, right? So if you go into import, you would see an option to import the, import a project as a new project or import a project 
uh, into your existing project that you already have. Uh, we've all added a bunch of improvements to, you know, improve the, uh, enhance the overall productivity while using Visualizer, like being able to build, uh, build in the background, right? So when you see that the build usually takes some time to, uh, to generate the binaries, this now happens in the background, allowing users to, you know, continue using Visualizer and continue enhancing their applications while they are doing the builds. Uh, we have an improved search functionality within Visualizer, and we have uh, a set of updated native fonts and things like that. We also have this new functionality called an app groups where you can uh, modularize your Visualizer project into groups, and then you can link these groups together and then use these groups uh, to, you know, more, uh, to create, you know, more, much more modular applications within Visualizer. Again, there are there are uh, there are more uh, features that I have not listed here, but again, I would I would encourage you to you know uh, have a look at the release notes to 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 see uh, to view all the features that that have made to this announcement. Uh, here's a quick look of some of these features. Right, so in this particular uh, example, we have we're looking at the capability to add uh, an existing project into my current, add a current, uh, add an existing project that I have into my current project. So I add it here. It shows me any other conflicts that I may have, and then it adds all the, you know, bunch of, uh, bunch of, uh, forms or, you know, uh, my JavaScript modules and things like that into, you know, my base, uh, my base project over here. I've added, so we have added these, uh, new set of fonts within Visualizer as well. These are the native fonts like San Francisco or, you know, Roboto for Android and things like that. Uh, improved search functionality, uh, like I'm searching for register swipe, it shows me all, uh, you know, all instances of, uh, of my keyword across, you know, my forms, my skins, my controllers and everything, right? So we, this is like an example of building background. I'm building for the Android Wear OS at this point and I'm still able to, you know, keep working with my visualizer in the, uh, in the, in the foreground. So all of these capabilities have been added as part of Visualizer Service Pack 2 uh, to, you know, enhance the overall experience of uh, working with Visualizer. Uh, like I said, we keep, we keep enhancing our widgets and APIs with every release, and we've added a bunch of enhancements and new uh, features as part of the widget enhancements, like being able to, you know, add bottom sheets for Android, uh, a new, uh, a lot of enhancements to our existing flex uh, and uh, flexible container widget. A lot of enhancements over to the segment, to the map widget, and things like these. Uh, again, uh, we we keep doing this with every release, be enhancing our existing omni-channel widget, and then enhancing our existing omni-channel APIs as well. So uh, we have added a new bunch of APIs, like the payment API. So this API works across Apple Pay and Google Pay. We've added uh, APIs to do uh, the, to link a user directly uh, to the App Store and the Play Store to, to you know to leave a rating and review over there. We've added APIs or enhanced APIs for keychain. We've added enhanced APIs for notifications, and then we have added APIs to do to, you know to support multi-window mode as well. Uh, here is a quick example or uh, a demo of you know uh, using the uh, the omnichannel payment API. In this particular case, I have an application that you, that you know uses the uh, the payment, and uh, here is a quick view at the you know the API in use, and then uh, you know I have an application that I have created uh, with this particular thing. So I have a, uh, with this particular feature, I have a list of deals that I get on this particular application, and then once I click through the deals, I have an option to uh, you know pay through Apple Pay, right? So I can select Apple Pay and then make a payment using, you know, the APIs that are available as part of uh, Kony Visualizer. Uh, uh, moving ahead, we've also made enhancements to our uh, app, uh, app viewer application that's available in the App Store. So in case you, uh, in case you are wondering what the app viewer is, uh, it's the same app preview application that we had in the App Store earlier. We have renamed this to app viewer and added a bunch of new functionalities like being able to connect your uh, iOS devices using USB tethering with Windows, uh, with your Windows laptops or Windows desktops, right? So we have added that functionality. So apart from, uh, you know, connecting iOS devices just with your Mac uh, OS, you can now connect it with your Windows OS as well. 
Uh, we have added the capability where your application view history is stored on the cloud so that if, even if you switch devices, you have your history available for you uh, moving between devices as well. There is a whole new uh, look and feel for the uh, marketplace. So what you're looking at right now on the right, the demo that you're looking at is the enhanced view of the marketplace. You can directly view uh, applications within marketplace. You can launch these applications within marketplace using your app viewer application as, uh, itself. We've also made a bunch of UX enhancements and we keep making these enhancements with every release on app viewer. So, so stay tuned for you know every update on app viewer and you will you will keep seeing you know new and new, newer features with with every release that we have on the app stores. Uh, lastly, I have a few other framework enhancements, right, that we have added across, you know, across the different uh, areas of Visualizer, uh, like uh, being able to support mipmaps for, uh, as part of, you know, launch icon images in Android, or enhancements for the native function interface, some of the security enhancements, and then we have, we have added over 50 plus uh, features or customer feature requests. Uh, as part of the frameworks and visualizer with this particular release, right? So if you had uh, some pending uh, STRs that that uh, uh, for a service pack two, you may have uh, you may have received these as part of the service pack two release itself. Now with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pass on the bait into uh, Suhas, and Suhas will walk us through you know some of the more features which are more oriented towards the back end and uh, fabric as well. Over to you, Suhas. Present. All right. Um, so let's get started with the, looking at the features that we released as part of Service Pack 2 for Fabric. I'll be just covering a few of the features and listing the rest of the features uh, from the release notes uh, for brevity. All right. So we'll start with a feature called as App Versioning that we released as part of SP2. So why have your apps worship, it, right? So it helps you in uh, uh, upgrading your applications, it eases maintenance, it uh, promotes the concept of uh, continuous development, and uh, you might want to have multiple versions of your app running in parallel, um, right, uh, with the client and server uh, backend apps running on different and, you know, uh, have a staggered rollout and have the ability to test beta builds before you actually release it to production with a targeted uh, you know, audience and if you are going to run into any issues or surprises, catch them early in the cycle so that, you know, you can react better for the same, right? So we have had versioning with Kony app platform in multiple levels uh, for a long time. We've always had visualizer app versions, right, where you uh, version your client-side applications and uh, give a creative builder rollout for them. Uh, we also had introduced the service uh, or API versioning uh, a couple of releases ago where you can version specific APIs uh, so that you can have a 1.2 version of the API and 2.2 version of the API and use them in different apps and you can modify and launch new versions of the API without having to rebuild the client binary. So these features were there even before the service pack 2. Now as part of service pack 2, what we have done is we have taken it a step further and we have uh, ensured that you can have multiple versions of the Fabric app that can coexist at the same time. So uh, this will let you uh, club a whole set of features, all the APIs and everything, and just give different versions for the Fabric backend app itself. And this lets you, you know, easily switch uh, uh, the Fabric app at runtime as well. So let's walk through a couple of uh, user scenarios where this will be useful, right? So we have a, a, an iterative development scenario where somebody wants to you know, has a version of the app 4.0 that is live. He wants to start development for the 4.1. And he knows that most of the 4.1 services will be inherited from 4.0 and it just needs a few modifications to it. But he wants to, you know, test it with a beta group first before actually making it fully live. So what we have done as part of this is we have given a default uh, version that can be selected for the Fabric app. So your client app, when it is built, can just point to the default, right? And what the default actually is something that you can just switch 
from the server so that your client binary can actually point to say the 1.2 or 2.2 by changing the default version from the backend. So this needs, you know, uh, this lets you test pilot groups without actually making new binaries. They can just have the same binary. You can just switch it from your server and then, you know, there is minimum downtime, almost no downtime actually, and you can test your app this way, right? And the other scenario that is more used is, you know, um, we might want to have different versions of the app pointing to different versions of, you know, your services or different regions uh, uh, for example, 1.2 might be uh, catering to one region, say US East, and 2.0 might be catering to a different region like uh, US West or a different, you know, you can just have the APIs itself pointing to different uh, database location or API, different backend APIs, right? So, or I might just have, you know, a global vendor and each local vendor, I might want to give a different version of the app, which provides better coverage for that specific area, right? So I'm, in a sense, saying I'm going to have 1.2, 2.2, 3.0, all my versions available parallelly and will be used by different versions of the client app at, in, at the same time, right? So this um, lets me uh, have all these different versions at the same time, right? So I can easily maintain the solution, host multiple versions, and I can explicitly link the client binary. So in the previous instance, I told that the client binary is built with, uh, you know, pointing to the default version of the app. Now, instead of default, it can actually give a specific version like 1.0, 2.0. So there is a close coupling between the actual client binary and the server, and you can maintain all of them in parallel. So this gives me, you know, ability to uh, handle this kind of a scenario as well. So now let's look at a um, demo of how this app versioning works. So this is the new screen where you see the app version at the top. You can create a new version. You can give a description for it. So in this specific case, I'm going to change my uh, backend from you know uh, one region to another. So I'm building a US Central specific app. I already had the service. I imported all of them because I just created a new version. Uh, I had a database connection URL which was pointing to US East. I'm changing it to US Central, and I'm going to save this and you know publish it. So now I have 1.0 which is pointing to US East and 2.0 which is pointing to US West. So I can uh, have two different client apps, uh, client binaries that are pointing to this uh, and make use of all the other features. And I can also switch as we saw in the previous screen that I can, whenever I release a newer version, I can choose to make it as a default if I choose to. In this case I have not, but if I just switch it to a default, then the earlier scenario of, or, or, you know, uh, switching the defaults with the client binary being the same can also be supported. So once this is done, you uh, go to the client binary, and in the client binary, you were earlier able to choose just the Fabric backend app. Now you can also choose the version of the Fabric app that you're building for. So I'm associating the client binary for US Central with the 2.0 version and able to build and use this. So this is about app versioning. Now let's move on to the next feature. So we have had uh, supported the, the concept of, you know, uh, Kony Fabric on cloud using our AWS or Amazon cloud, and we have had on-prem both for quite some time. Now with SP2, we have uh, had added support for uh, Kony Fabric on Microsoft Azure, right? So Fabric, how we are doing this is we are using, uh, we are packaging Fabric using Docker on Azure, and so it is uh, built on uh, the Kubernetes technology, and uh, it is scalable to any uh, cloud computing platform which hosts Kubernetes. So basically, uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, OpenShift, or Azure, anything can be used for this, right? And the whole Fabric deployment is up and running in just about two hours. So let's look at a quick uh, demo of how this looks, right? So basically, the fabric, um, we have the install script, and once you run the install script, it has a bunch of configuration for, you know, the Azure deployment configuration, the database connection parameters, and fabric administrator user registration based settings. So once you modify the settings and you run it, it configures and deploys to the specified Azure resources, and it deploys the database script, and it uh, deploys the components of the fabric onto that particular uh, instance of Azure that you have configured, right? So once it is configured, um, once it is uh, you know, deployed and set up, 
uh, you have the environment fully created. You can uh, go to the app gateway and uh, pull the specific URL for the Fabric console, and you can just uh, hit that URL uh, from a browser and uh, test. So in this case, we're going to the MF console, uh, signing in with the default credentials, and uh, we're going to import um, a Fabric app into this newly created instance and uh, test it out to ensure that it was you know, successfully uh, set up and it is working fine. So we just imported a package. We're going to publish it to the created environment. And uh, once we create it, uh, once it's published, we are going to test it to ensure that uh, it is working end to end. So the successful response proves that the setup is correct, right? So this was a brief uh, demo about uh, Fabric using Docker. So now let's move on to the next feature that we are going to show, right? So service monitoring. So we have had analytics built into Kony platform uh, right from uh, uh, you know, uh, like five years ago or something. And we have not had the capability of viewing the load at real time. The analytics for cloud is like 10, 15 minutes behind time um, because it is the gathered data. For on-prem, it has always been um, real time. But we lack the capability of uh, seeing the performance per service, see the error rate on a five minute or a five minute interval, and uh, you know, um, uh, see uh, this in more real time. So. There was a request from several customers that they want to be able to see the association between child and parent services and be able to see this data in more real time. So for this, we built this feature called as service monitoring, which uh, lets you look the data from a five minute range at any time in the last seven days uh, for each of the services, as well as you know, give you data in terms of uh, percentage success, percentage failure, you, should, you are able to export it to a data as a CSV. You can choose the custom range anything to as small as a five minute window to as much as a whole week if required, right? So let's look at a quick demo of the service monitoring feature, right? So this is a new screen that we have added as part of the admin console of uh, Kony Fabric. It will show up in this section on the service monitor and you will be able to see um, the time range. And uh, so the time range, you can choose a window which is as small as five minutes to uh, a week, or you can choose a custom and then go and choose a five minute or a 15 minute range in any time between uh, now and a week ago. So the data is flushed out after a week because this is storing actually minute by minute data. So we don't want to overburden and slow down the process. So for that reason, we only hold a max of a week of data in this. And whenever uh, an issue occurs, right? So an error can cause the service response or the response time to go way higher than for a successful case. So we have an error filter as part of the service monitoring wherein you can choose to include the errors or exclude the errors in, when you're looking at the data. And for each of the services, the data is uh, available in terms of you know the object, the operation, and verb, and even the version of the API for the specific case. And every single operation, you will be able to see the data in terms of the different phases where the, this time is spent, right? So for example, we have a, an external duration, which is the actual backend call, a preprocessor duration in case you've written a preprocessor for the app, a transformation duration in case you've written an XPath and it is transforming the data from the XPath to the result object, or if, there is, if you're using an object service and a request map duration or a response map duration, post process duration. So all this duration is captured and it shows the date times of min, max, and average for that specific uh, duration that you are looking at, right? So this way it gives you very granular info of how your services are performing at real time um, uh, when your app is in use, right? And yeah. so uh, the API errors, as I said, uh, can have significant errors. So you have the ability to just exclude the errors and look at the performance when there is no errors or include it and see how it is performing. Or if you just want to see errors to see how bad it is, so you can choose to do that too. Now this is quite a lot of data, so in case of a production app, you might have hundreds of services. So we have the ability to export the data into a CSV so that you can look at it you know, uh, at ease from an Excel 
and uh, be able to sort and filter any uh, custom uh, filtering that you want to do on it or you know uh, see only things which had errors or any such further logic you want to do you can do on your excel and look at the data from that perspective so with that uh, let's conclude uh, this service monitoring section now let's move on to the next feature uh, this is just to show a preview of what is coming out in sp3 we are adding a graph so that you can also see performance per uh, service in real time in terms of graph in addition to just the tabular data that we are having as part of sp2 so let's move on to uh, another feature called as custom hooks of app factory so for those of you who are not familiar with what app factory is so app factory is basically uh, you know it's a ci cd a continuous integration continuous deployment tool that uh, coni has built that provides a solution to accelerate app development uh, supported with Kony technologies like Visualizer, Fabric, and of course the App Factory runtime with industry-leading tools, best practices, and governance to get the most out of your agile development teams in the digital space. So this is basically to ensure that uh, you can build, test, and distribute your apps using the Kony App Factory. Right? So in a quick overview, so App Factory runtime allows users to maintain their code in a JIT repository and anytime they push a change we can automatically start a build perform a scheduled build or even start an ad hoc build with few simple steps so once the build is started the app factory can build across multiple digital channels in parallel and it can also you know run specific tests on your finished binaries or web apps while providing you results you know uh, access to the concise set of test results and app binaries so this lets you you know um, lets the team focus on actually building apps and not building CI CD for your production grade apps right so we released this in SP1 um, and in SP1 we were focused on delivering Kony uh, you know Kony uh, built apps using a core set of tools like Jenkins Git, and AWS device form and we got a lot of feedback on other third-party tools that teams wanted to use such as Kony's Hawk Hawkeye security tool or even other you know third-party device testing tools additionally some teams needed to make specific changes to files in the workspace you know, between stages of the build process or even automatically upgrade projects to the release or to the latest release on the fly. So taking this feedback, we wanted to bring flexibility to the app factory using what we call as a custom hook. So now let's look at the custom hook in action. Right. So you notice that we have added a section called as custom hook in the visualizer section if you're already familiar with app factory console that we've added uh, for this and on opening the section we can see the hook points hook up points um, for example the uh, pre-build post build and post test hook up points where you can add your um, custom hooks so notice that once a hook has been added into a particular thing it can be moved up or down uh, so that you can modify the order in which it is executed but you cannot move it from one hook point to another so a pre-built hook cannot be moved to a post build hook so that way it gives you the flexibility to move what it was built for not but not for something else now look let's look at a, the upgrade plugins hook to see how it looks like right so you have a hook a hook name or you have the channels where you can choose what channels the hook is available for so by default it is i mean you can choose a specific channel like an android mobile tablet or you can choose set that it is executable for everything right you can also choose the build action like whether it has to execute an ant or maven and in this case i'm choosing ant and then you hook the archive file the archive file actually has the logic for the custom hook so in this case the archive file just has you know the build.xml and an update helper py which is the core python script which has the intelligence for whatever the custom hooks action has to be so once you have created a custom hook you can choose uh, any build that you've already set to whether to enable the custom hook or not so the when you open the build you see all the parameters like you know your code branch your any app config that you're trying to do or any other settings that were part of that particular build so now as part of this um, we also added a checkbox at the bottom um, for specifically enabling custom hooks so you can choose to 
check or uncheck this for every specific builds that you have so that it enables it to run at uh, runtime. So once you have set it, now I'm going to execute this particular um, job uh, and it executes and I have integrated Kuni Hawkeye, which is going to send me a mail uh, with the uh, security scan for that specific thing and on opening the link, I get the actual results from the security scan. So this shows that I was able to create a custom hook, add it to my build, and it on execution uh, does its job and in this case ran the scan and gave me the results via email. Right. So this is a brief uh, demo about uh, custom hooks on Kony App Factory. So let's quickly move on to the next section, which is offline objects. So Offline objects, for those of you that are not familiar, is a new synchronization capability that we added to V8 version of the Kony Fabric object services. So it uses the existing Kony Fabric runtime server. It doesn't need any other additional runtime servers. It downloads the data uh, into SQLite uh, for, uh, for offline access. Uh, it uses OData protocol and it works with Kony Visualizer, Kony iOS SDK, and Kony Android SDK for, you know, if you want to build it for native Android Studio or Xcode. And you can do several things with it, like you know, tracking sync progress and parallel sync. So uh, since we are almost out of time, I'm not going to go into details of how it works. Uh, they had already given a session on offline objects uh, earlier, and there is a recording of this available in Basecamp. I would suggest you go and visit that. So some of the major features that we added to offline objects as part of SP2 is that we have added compatibility with the Kony reference architecture. So it is now fully compatible with Kony reference architecture. It also supports uh, what is called a service-driven object type of object service. So basically an integration service wrapped with an uh, Android object service is called an SDO. So we have added support for that. We also added support for binary download as a part of SP2. And other interesting features that we added is like, you know, we have added a, a sync config policy such that you can only upload records or only download records, right? So you don't want to do both upload and download. You can choose to set only one of them. You can choose to enable or disable intermediate tracking. So for example, uh, say I'm working on a work order, it's not complete yet, I don't want to synchronize it, right? I can choose to uh, disable it, uh, you know, mark for upload false for that particular thing such that this record is not synchronized, but the other records are synchronized. So I can use such kind of policies or say I'm working on an, uh, uh, a work, work order or any change in my client app, and I'm doing a lot of iterations. So it will be a create, an update, an update, an update. Now, by default, when you synchronize it, the exact same set of operations is replayed back to the server. So it will be a create, update, update. But your backend might not need it, or your, you, know, uh, you might just want to synchronize the last state and not keep track of all the intermediate states. So in that case, you can disable intermediate tracking such that only the last state is being tracked. And when you synchronize it, the last state is played back. So all the intermediate updates are not required. The final state as it is in your client app is synchronized to the backend. So that kind of data is also there. And we also added support for what is called the incremental metadata. So say you started working with an object, uh, an object, they added a new field to the object. So uh, in earlier things, you would not be able to accommodate it without changing the client app. But with the incremental metadata support, you can just enable incremental metadata when you're building the binary, uh, when you're creating the binary, right? And it will automatically take care of, you know, uh, new additions and deletions for fields in an object or new additions or deletions of an object itself in an object service and be able to automatically create the tables and synchronize the data as part of sync if you enable this feature. And we also added support for uh, canceling sync or, you know, uh, recording, uh, uh, you know, doing uh, hierarchical uploads based on record-based batching and such. So this is just a slide showing that we added support for SDO. And we also added a feature called as upload cache. So basically, uh, say there was a network failure after you uploaded the data from the client app to the server. And before the backend service could react and give the data back to the client, you went into a tunnel, so you lost connection. So the client app is now unaware that the synchronization has happened to the backend. So as far as it knows, the data did not get synchronized. So it will try to send the data again when you do a synchronization next time. So if the backend can handle this kind of a scenario, well and good, you don't need an upload cache. But 
say it cannot handle and you don't want it to create duplicates in your backend, you can enable this feature called as upload cache, wherein what it does is it maintains a cache on the server for like a 24 hours or something. So if the same payload comes back to it, it checks and says, hey, I already got this and this is the response I got from the server. And without contacting the backend, it sends the response back to the client app and that way the client app gets its state synchronized with what is there in the server without having to contact the uh, final backend server in itself. Right. Um, so we are actually out of time, so I'll skip this the demo. Um, this again, as I said, I've already given a, a full-fledged webinar on option objects, so you can look through that um, to get more information on this. So as I said, we could only briefly look through some of the features for offline object, I'm sorry, for Fabric and SP2. The full set of features are there in the release notes. You can go to the uh, release notes sections in the community or in Basecamp, and you can look through the specific sections to get more information on each of the features that were released as part of SP2. The section has the features for the entire you know, um, uh, V8, so you can look the earlier links to look through the data that was happened even for early releases if required. Uh, that's it from my side. Uh, back to you, Tanmay. Thank you, Suhas. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining this session. I hope uh, this was um, equally learning session for all of us. It was a great, great session, Suhas. Thank you, Fezan. Thank you, Suhas. Um, Suhas, we have a few questions that we want you to look at um, in the Q&A panel, if you can. Um, and if you want, I can read it, read it out for you, whatever is comfortable. I'm looking through it, just give me a minute. Sure. Is data by default encrypted when offline services? No, uh, encryption is an optional uh, setting, so you can choose to enable encryption or disable encryption. That is a uh, setting that is available for the app developer. Can we view the service request and response? Yes, um, there is a feature called as uh, um, trace locks that we added to uh, Kony Fabric. So if you enable trace locks, you can actually look at the HTTP payload for the request as well as the response. Um, you want the demo projects or source code. So the source code for the demo project is part of the uh, starting guide, getting started guide itself. So there is a getting started guide for offline objects. In that there is a section called as the technical uh, this thing. You can uh, go there and click. It will have the sample uh, project source code for both an SAP based app as well as the uh, database based app. Uh, we have an app built on Kony Studio 6.x and yeah. okay. So sync. Um, the earlier sync, uh, if it is using uh, object services, as I said, the Kony offline objects uses object services. So if it is already using offline objects, uh, object services, migrating from your earlier sync to this will be relatively uh, easier uh, because your backend is already in place and you just have to change the client APIs to use uh, the newer versions of APIs. So there is no automatic migration. You have to make code changes. Uh, but if the backend is object service, you have relatively less work to do. Otherwise, you just have to first make your backend as object service and then change the client APIs on the uh, to change from you know uh, the earlier sync to uh, offline objects. All right. Uh, partial upload. Uh, so that you can look at the details uh, for this from the APIs or I'll get back to you because we're already out of time. Uh, I think if there are any other questions, I'll answer them uh, offline. Uh, it will be updated as part of the Basecamp link itself. Okay. Yeah, sure. So um, in case of, uh, if you have more questions, you can post it in the base, uh, you know, in forums uh, on Basecamp and we have experts looking at those questions and you'll get the answers there. Um, we will also be posting this recording of this webinar in the same article. Um, that we have on Basecamp right now. So look for the recording and you can even share the links with others uh, if you think those people have missed the live, live session. Um, our next session is on FFI versus NFI and this is on 20th of June. So make sure you register for this event. The same event is available um, on Basecamp. Just go ahead and register for this um, to get uh, you know timely updates. And then uh, after registration, you will get the notifications and then you can easily join the session.
Um, if you still have more questions, uh, please go ahead and put it up in the Q&A panel. Uh, if you're not able to answer it right now, we'll definitely answer it after the session and we'll post it, um, um, you know, in the same place where we post the recording so that you can have a look later. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks uh, for joining this session. Thanks, Suhas. Thanks, Faisan, and everybody who's answering uh, the Q&A panel, all experts, panel experts. Um, we'll uh, see you again soon. Thank you.